Mr. Chief Justice, may it please the court, Stephen Rosenthal on behalf of Fred Guttenberg sitting at council table along with my colleague Alyssa Del Riego and also on behalf of 11 other families of 11 other victims who were either shot or killed, shot and killed or shot and injured at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School uh, on Valentine's Day of 2018. The previous oral argument has really framed a lot of questions. So what I'd like to try to do with the court's indulgence is to try to hit on those themes and tie them together, but also to make sure that I don't uh, avoid talking about some things that didn't get airtime that but I do think are important. Can I, can I talk about one of those things? And I don't want to stop you from asking the question, but of course. I'm, I'm, I'm personally, and I, I haven't spoken to any of my colleagues, a little troubled by the procedural posture of this case. And you make reference a to it a little bit in your brief. Um, fast forward with me for a moment. Um, w would not the best thing for us to do would be to issue whatever opinion we are going to issue in case number one, the one we just heard, and then essentially do a GVR, a, a, a grant, vacate and reverse, and allow the lower court with a fuller record, um, including the complaints that were actually filed in the 11 or 19 other cases, um, to, to then evaluate whether it meets whatever requirements we've set out for what incident and occurrence means? Yes, precisely, because we don't have facts yet in this case. We have a bare declaratory judgment complaint which was decided based upon the Barnett case in the fourth DCA, then the complaints were filed. Did, did and so you, depending upon the rule the court adopts, it will obviously impact what happens. The record's quite limited, what we have before us, but did you argue in either your papers or at the, the, the ultimate hearing before judgment was entered that, hey, maybe we should slow down on this thing and, and get a full record? Yes, and that's in our briefs. The uh, counsel for our team argued to the court that it would be premature on this non-existent record to make a determination even if taking the defendant's position that it's the act or omission of the, the negligent act or omission that governs uh, what is or isn't a different incident or occurrence, we still don't know what the pleadings are in this case yet. So yes, and I think that regardless of what this court does in terms of the rule it adopts, as applied to our case, uh, the, the cake hasn't been baked yet. Their case, they could still amend, so it's not fully baked either. But our case, the dough is uh, not even in the oven, so to speak. Um, so if we, I can, we, let me just point we, this out to flag it before I get okay. tied up in many different knots, which is that I do think it's critical that we make sure that we address, and I want to present to the court cogently and quickly, uh, the statutory interpretation arguments, just the key points. And Justice Lawson, I don't mean to delay your question. If I may just say this point yeah, and then try to address. That's the school board's position, as the Department of Financial Services position in the case before us, is less consistent with the intent of the legislature based on the plain text of the statute, especially subsection five. And ours is more consistent, and that is obviously the poll star to which this court uh, ascribes and seeks to follow. The reason is threefold. First of all, as has been mentioned by Ms. Waldman Ross, and I won't spend a lot of time on it, if you were to substitute negligent act or omission of the employee as the unit for deciding what is a different incident or occurrence, that is inconsistent with the fact that the legislature in 1973 used that term in all different places in the statute, but not right here where it matters in subsection five, sentence two. So that gives rise to a strong presumption that they meant something different when they talked about same incident or occurrence. That's number one. Number two is they also used the word occurrence itself in subsection 10 of the 1973 act. Subsection 10 is one that we don't see anymore because in 1977 it was stricken. Subsection 10 had a series that said, quote, negligent, yada, 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 to use Justice Luck's ellipsis, act, negligent act, omission, or occurrence, right next to each other. Well, let, let me, so there, there are two statutory construction issues. The first is, um, in a derivative claim, what does incident or occurrence refer to, right? Well, I think it's incident or occurrence in the statute without regard to what type of theory and the answer to that, we submit, as we've briefed, especially in detail in the reply brief, is that the same, the, uh, uh, same manner and same extent provision, which is in the prior sentence of subsection five, is the legislature's adoption of the common law. Basically, it says government agencies and instrumentalities are subject to the same set of rules in tort liability as private parties, except as enumerated herein. And so, when you look to what it, the question is, what is a private party in a derivative liability situation faced with, with their liability, both in the manner of it and the extent? Obviously, the extent here is capped against government agencies. Nobody's contesting that. That works in its own mechanism. 
But we have answers from the common law about how a derivative liability defendant alleged to have been negligent to have foreseeably facilitated the intentional criminal acts of a wrongdoer, whether it be a DCF circumstance and somebody in custody or the, the, the pur purview of the agency or in the context of uh, a murder on private property. In both contexts, that law is clear. And I think that that brings up the bigger point, which is this. So the, but the law you're talking about there is insurance law, correct? Well, it's the insurance company's liability per se, directly, because it's a but, private But you're entity. talking about, if I understand, tell me if I'm wrong, you're not talking about cases that just determine what the liability um, of the vicariously or the, the derivatively liable um, person is. You're talking about what the insurance law provides and how they're going to be covered by their insurance. Is I, think that right? that, I think that's a fair point, but I guess my, my reaction is to say it doesn't really make a difference, and here's why. Because well, but that, but it, this, when you're saying that you're relying on this language that the legislature's used that refers to how, how a, a <clears throat> private persons could be held liable, you're talking about something that's a little different. I, I, so I'm, I'm, there seems to be a, it kind of morphs well, from that into this, this insurance law issue of what we have said in these insurance cases, where, which if it looks like to me, we're to, we've, that's all been driven by a particular um, uh, understanding of the term accident, uh, a kind of creative understanding of what an accident is. So here's why I don't think the court should be troubled by what you just articulated, which is fair. The reason it should not be is that what, what the legislature did, and it borrowed it verbatim from the Federal Tort Claims Act, which was 15 years or so prior, in the 50s. It said, uh, sorry, it was in the 40s, and it was interpreted by the Supreme Court you know, of the United States in the 50s. It said, we're going to adopt a very broad and general borrowing provision from the common law as to government agencies that are now subject to tort liability. We're borrowing. We're putting them in the same position as a private party, except as specifically stated. Now. That doesn't answer the question. It doesn't define incident and occurrence, and it doesn't provide us this separating principle for what's but it, same and what's But it's what's not different. necessarily always as a private person, because as you said, there's limitations on punitive damages and prejudgment interest. Yes. But there's also the, the elephant in the room, which is the statutory cap. Yes, but nobody's, nobody's contesting that. The question really is, how does the statutory cap apply, and what rule do you use? Because what's maddening, right, about the statute is it doesn't disaggregate. It doesn't tell you what's one incident, what's one occurrence. Is it one van driving in one swerving accident? But, but let me time different. And, and if I can just make this key point to, to Justice Well, okay, so we can't get any questions in, though, if you keep making all your points. But go ahead. Okay, so you my answer need, is that... probably need to answer the justices' questions. That would be my advice to you. Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm trying. I'm, I'm, my, qu my answer to your question is that when they embrace this broad borrowing principle that's in the face of the statute, they or said not. look to the common yeah. law. Yeah. The common law that's most analogous to this question of when there are caps, and we're capping per person and per incident or occurrence that's right, the same incident occurrence. But it's the common law taken from the time when the king could say, you can't sue the king unless I consent. So you, you, you're not taking it just from common law, you're taking it from common law with a particular doctrine of sovereign immunity which has a special application. Well, I don't disagree with that. And what they did is they used this provision, and I would commend the court to the U.S. Supreme Court's 2019 decision in JAM, which is in our reply brief. And JAM talks about the Federal Tort Claims Act as part of its analysis. And what it says is that the federal statute, which ours is patterned after, this court's I, 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 I really am trying to help you because it seems like we're so far off from the, the critical issue is what, do, what does a phrase mean in a statute? I mean, that really is the issue. What does incident or occurrence mean right. in this statute? And it's your position that that relates to the immediate cause, correct? Correct. Okay. The, the problem, the biggest obstacle I see to that is that it does look like, and it was addressed in the prior argument, that term could, could refer to, I mean, reasonably understood to mean the overall occurrence, the overall incident, or sliced down to individual incidents in what, in common parlance, people do talk about is the, the occurrence or the incident. Um, so if there are two ways to read it, that would be an ambiguity, correct? If there were, uh, that's 
it would be, but I do not think there is, and here's why. First of all, before you get to ambiguity in statutory constructions, the court's obviously very familiar, you can look to dictionary definitions and you look to other provisions of the statute. If in looking at the dictionary definitions and other provisions of the statute, it points in a clear direction, and I submit it does in this case, then you don't have ambiguity. But and it's not also the first thing you do is you have to look at the reasonable interpretation. If, if you have a reasonable interpretation, you don't need to, there is no ambiguity. If the, well, obviously it can't be an absurd result, I agree. Right. And the dictionary definition, I mean, Justice but Kennedy we, said. But don't we have to also look at, I mean, we all are, seem to be not addressing this particular language because it specifically also says arising out of the same incident or occurrence. I mean, that's a, it's a phrase and it's part of the phrase and it modifies incident or occurrence, so it has to arise out of, and that has also a special meaning, correct? Right, and that ties, ties to Justice Luck's original question in the prior argument, which is, you know, are we looking at claims here first, or are we looking at incidents and occurrences? And I think that the nexus that is, if you think of it as a tree, the incidents and occurrences are the roots. They give rise to a tree. They, claims arise out of the incidents and occurrences. The statute speaks of paid claims or judgments that arise out of the same incident or occurrence. So the, the branches of the tree are the claims. They, the key question is, what's the roots that they arise from? Are they different roots? So as to the, I'm sorry to interrupt you. So as to the, as to the separability issue, um, the statute was adopted in 73, right? The language that we're talking about. In 2003, in the Coicos case, Justice Wells writes, I find no court from across the country that has found multiple occurrences under facts similar to this case. And so I think he accepts your premise that you can't just look at the claim, you've got to look at you know, the facts. And so if we're supposed to be in part thinking, okay, what was the legislature, what was the common understanding, the meaning of those words in 1973 when they're used, and if there's no sort of known fixed principle about how you do the separation, even if I accept your premise that we're looking at the injury causing conduct, um, how do we answer then, how, do you, how, do you, how, does, how does your overall argument play into sort of the uncertainty in the law at that point? And why wouldn't we, if it is uncertain as to the separability, why wouldn't we defer to the basic kind of summer, uh, sovereign immunity default of strict construction? Good question. The, the, the reason is that the legislature in 73, by adopting this principle of same manner and same extent, did not adopt a fixed view of what the law is. That's evident in the generality of that borrowing provision. It's a but, choice of law provision. But it's a common law. But it, we've, said, we've said, and numerous courts have said, that in, where there's a derivation of the common law, and here it quite clearly is, that it's to be strictly construed. And that's true in, in this context and many other contexts where we derivate from the common law. Again, I would point you to the U.S. Supreme Court's recent decision in JM, which is so interesting on this point, because the argument there concerned a same-as provision in the FTCA and another statute, and they were using the FTCA as an, as an example. And they said, well, Congress could have done a, said, the, we're borrowing the law as of this date and freezing it in time, or we're borrowing the law with certain exceptions. But they didn't. They did a same-as provision, same as the common law, essentially. And what the U.S. Supreme Court said is that was a deliberate legislative choice. It was knowing. And it was to make, I mean, look, the, the common law is not a static object. It evolves as court's wisdom imparts rules to complex human behavior. We would have to, unwa the U.S. Supreme Court can do whatever it wants with regard to a federal law and its interpretation of the FTCA, but, but we would have to unravel, if we were to unravel the principle that a statute in derivation of the common law is not to be construed strictly, that would have to apply in many, many circumstances um, outside of this one, and I think could, could be problematic. Well, what I'm submitting to the court is that even if you don't buy my position that you never reach the strict construction uh, principle, the language that we're talking about is to strictly construe the language of the statute. It is that first sentence of subsection 5. And I would cite, Justice Luck, you to the commercial carrier decision from this court in 1979, which said expressly that the legislature of Florida borrowed the F uh, Federal Tort Claims Act, and also this court's decision but in Barrett versus Metro Dade County. I'm struggling to understand why we would not apply that same uh, rule of construction to the scope of the waiver. I mean, it, it, you're saying it only gets, it, you only apply it to whether the waiver, uh, whether there is or is not a waiver. 
And I, I can't un no. No, I agree with you, Your Honor. I think that I think that if look, you're reading the statute in a way that has to be faithful to the language of the statute. And my submission to the court is that if you look at the language and what it was intended in subsection five, sentence one, the same manner, same extent, it is a deliberately broad provision which sort of pushes away the strict construction canon because you have to strictly construe that particular choice by the legislature, and that is to adopt but that's private the, laws. Well, the, what we're looking at here is this choice, the specific choice that the legislature made uh, to limit uh, the aggregate uh, claims arising out of the same incident or occurrence. That's the focus here, right? Yes. And the question becomes, what principle do you grapple with to separate one incidence from another, one occurrence from another? The dictionary definition, uh, Justice Lagoa, has a, uh, you know, a separate, the word separate is part of the dictionary definition of um, uh, an incident. It's a separate and discrete act. And as Ms. Waldman Ross said, a, an occurrence kind of adds the temporal dimension. It's sort of something that occurs. It's designed to happen over time more. The, the conundrum is, how do you apply that in a particular circumstance? And the answer we submit is, in the Zamora case came closest, because it basically said, look, we have a lot of principles in the common law to determine whether one thing is different from another. Is one apple different from another apple? And the way to do that is to look at a variety of principles. And so you look at time, space, and manner. You look at certain claim splitting rules because those are designed to answer the same type of question. Were the things that happened at different times, and to use Justice Muniz's example, which I think is a good hypothetical, in the DCF example, bad uh, employee comes in and abuses somebody in the same house one year, comes back another year, does the same thing, another year the ne next thing. I know you did one month, one month, one month. The time period lends itself to all of us saying, of course, that's how, a different how incident. How would you address occurrence. my hypothetical? Which is the bus about swerving? The, uh, the, the bus hitting a pedestrian, then in a car, and then another car. The question, I, I, my, my reaction to that as an individual is that that's going to be one occurrence. If you then say, what if it's different? What if they go for 10 minutes time and the person is texting the entire time while driving the bus and somehow manages like Mr. Magoo to stay on the road and blows through five different red lights separated by a mile each and hits a different car at each light? We could arguably say under the common law, well, those are different instances of negligence at each time, perhaps, because at each point in time, they could have seen the other cars or the pedestrian crossing, but was looking at the device. My point is simply that the common law has ways of separating incidences and occurrences. The government's suggestion, I'm into my rebuttal time, so I want to save it, is that you don't even have to get into that. You just put this big label of negligence over it, which would mean effectively that in the Parkland shooting scenario, a week later, a copycat shooter could have come into the school, had it been open, and done the same thing, and the school board would be saying, same incidents or occurrence. It was just our negligence security. That cannot be the rule. That is imparting far too much sovereign immunity into the statute, much more than the legislature said through its borrowing provision, look to the common law and treat us the same as a private individual. With that, I'd like to reserve my time. Good morning, Eugene Pettis on behalf of the School Board of Broward County. I'm from Halleck, Pettis and Schwarm here with my partner, Ms. Debbie Clauber. The, there, there have been a number of questions, uh, but I think we need to look at the true context of the statute. This is an issue of one occurrence, one incident. We don't have the situation where it's days or weeks later. This all happened in a matter of a few minutes, where one gunman came onto the campus. We now have about 33 complaints. They're all sounding in negligence. But, but counsel, if, if different agencies acted in different negligent ways that resulted in, in killings of different people. How is that not separate and unique claims? For example, let me give you a hypothetical. If there is a negligence claim against the Broward Sheriff's Office for failing to provide um, on-site security or, or doing something on the date of the incident itself versus the school board for failing to do something about the, the shooter in this case based on information, separate and apart from DCF, who may have been negligent for failing to intervene in, in the shooter's life. Those are all potentially separate claims of negligence that resulted in 
in an injury, correct? Certainly. And could those, I guess my question is if that, and I don't know what the complaints are, that's part of my issue in the case, but if assuming those complaints allege those separate things against separate people, could those separate claims of negligence, which sound in different theories, itself aggregate such that it's 250 for one, 250 for another, 250 for another? The, there are multiple Broward Sheriff's offices in virtually all of the cases, if not all of the cases that we're in. Uh, and you have Henderson Clinic and some others. Uh, while they're all sounding in negligence, there are different actions which are being alleged by them. One, uh, you know, the school resource officer Peterson uh, doing what he did or did not do. Those are different facts, but they're all being found, you know, generally in negligence. There's some unique pieces, uh, but negligence is the underwriting incident. My, my concern is that that's looking at, that seems to be looking at a level of generality that's a bit too high for the language that's at issue here, um, because there could be different theories of negligence and different incidents of negligence within the same realm of occurrence. So using the bus analogy of, of the Chief Justice, um, I, I, you know, there could be a situation where we'd all agree that there's a, a, a head-on collision for one van, and then 50 miles down the road, a head-on collision for another van which individually causes separate incidents there. I think we'd all agree those are separate negligent acts which resulted in separate injuries, correct? Correct. And that would be, you would agree with me, I think, that it would be 250 ag or 200 or 300 aggregate for one and 200 or 300 aggregate for the other. If you bring that into the context of this particular 76828 sub five, yes. you have, the, the language is clear in and of itself. It states, is there one claim? If there's one claim uh, that arose out of that particular occurrence or incident, then you have $200,000. If there's more than one claim, you have $300,000. The aggregate kicks in, and the aggregate controls, but the, the statute... But the aggregate is for the total. The it total. says the total of, with all other claims or judgments. So you could have 10 claims. You could have 100 claims. But there are, the, the aggregate is 300, period. Period. And, and the reason the aggregate is 300, because they didn't stop there in the particular statute. What they, what they said was, if it goes beyond that, each and every one of those people, let's say it's 50 claims, hypothetically, 50 but, claims. But, but counsel, those are, the, the example I gave you are clearly separate incidents of negligence. And, and yes, there are gonna be multiple people filing claims, but they're filing claims because those are very separate acts. I mean, let's take it even further. That van driver, three days later, um, happens to be somewhere else and swerves into a van, assuming no the van's still operating. But, so, so at some point you would agree with me that it becomes separate. No, no question. But in the context of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas case, we have a, 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 a nightmare of six minutes, uh, a contiguous, continuous action that occurred. Uh, I, I appreciate, and we've gone through a lot of the scenarios of different hypotheticals, but in this particular context, our legislature looked at this and said, we don't bar any of those claimants from their, their right to bring a case to get a judgment and to seek recovery. But what we're going to do is. And you can get a judgment in excess of the cap. Go to the legislature. But, but go to the legislature but, for the excess. The council analogizing this to the van situation, as I understand it, and again, the part of the problem is we don't know the nature of the complaints, but, but I, I, I suspect that some of the complaints, and we'll ask your colleague when he comes back up here, um, some of the complaints alleged negligence that started six months, a year before this incident. In other words, it was a negligent act that happened far removed and at a different agency from the school board that, that ultimately led to this incident, separate apart from uh, the school resource officer or what any teacher did at the time at the day of, right? Yes, I mean, there, there are allegations against Henderson Clinic that's a year before us. Right. We're, you know, we're not here for Henderson. So how's that not the van driver, and I agree with you, but how's that not the van driver who three days later hit somebody Henderson um, Clinic is not coming here uh, fighting for sovereign immunity. Well, I understand that, but there may be other agencies like DCF or the sheriff's office or, and I don't know the universe, that's part of the problem here, but there may be others that do allege that there's conduct far removed from the, the, the hour or 30 minutes or however time that this incident actually happened. With, with, with regard to uh, the period of time that, that we're covering, in this particular instance, and there are scenarios that we can stretch out, uh, which I believe is why uh, we should not be reconstructing this statute for a given scenario because of the fact that this statute 
has been around for a long time, all of my legal career representing public entities. And the application, I've never heard of the derivative uh, argument, that there's a derivative claim and somehow that's treated differently because it's someone else outside of the school board's own negligence. You're not gonna find that in one particular case. You're not gonna find that argument any place. In this context, I think it's no. Well, let's take Zamora, um, because Zamora is, is, in my mind, the clearest incidence of two separate, two separate individual actions which result in damages. So in Zamora, you have a discrimination claim which lasted for some period of time during the period of employment. You have a termination, and then you have a retaliation claim for what happened and damages arising from what happened after, they, um, after there was a reporting of, of the discrimination. Um, you, you, do you agree with the result in Zamora treating those separately and applying the aggregate cap separately to each of those? Absolutely, because okay. of what you just indicated there. You had a, uh, a age discrimination case and you had a retaliation. Those are two separate causes of action. Here we have one negligence. It's all negligence. We're, we're, we're being sued primarily. Well, it's, it, those are two different, it, it is all negligence, but it's not necessarily one negligence, right? It's, it's, it's not the acts. They're going to suggest, uh, as are in the pleadings and all the complaints that have been filed, that you left the gate open. You didn't call code red. Those are, those are the deviations that equal up to the negligence. The jury doesn't get to make a, a judgment for each act of deviation. They get to find out, was the aggregate or the collection of those actions negligent? Any one or the collection? And how do we, as a, how do, how do, so I'm a trial judge. I'm sitting here trying to figure this all out. Sir, Where do I look? Do I look at the complaints in front of me and say, what is, is this truly separate or is this just a composite of acts equaling the whole? You look at this, are there negligence claims being brought here? The answer is yes. And nobody's going to d d disagree with that, I don't think. If there are negligence claims, then in this context, y you, you follow the, the cap. It's not how many different theories, because it was stated earlier by Mrs. Ross that you should not open yourself up for manipulation of the pleadings. If we travel down your line, then we can come up with, as we do in these cases, A through Z of different actions. Well, but if they all equal up to negligence, where is a trial judge? Where is a trial judge? Am I to look then? Uh, uh, that's fine. I'm, uh, let's take the pleadings out of it. Where do I look? Where do you look to see what? To see if it's truly separate. If it's a negligence action. If it's anything. You, you look at the complaint. So I, that's what I just said. So we look at the complaint to see if it's. Six, if it alleges one act of negligence six months earlier and one act of negligence six months later and, and seeming to be different government agencies with seeming different acts, if, that's, if I have that scenario, um, then is that separate and applies the aggregate cap to each? The way of the law, and, 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 and I think there's very little exception, if you have governmental agencies involved in the same occurrence, then you're dealing with one cap. But if, uh, they're, if they're separate negligent acts, by the governmental entity, aren't those treated separately? They're not the same incident or occurrence, right? Give me your, if they're, if they're not, if they're actions in the context if, of like you going left the gate open. Going uh, back to Justice Luck's example earlier, if you have separate governmental entities, different acts of negligence, aren't those treated differently? differently and under separate caps for purposes of the statute. There could be given the factual scenario. Uh, it okay. just depends on the factual scenario. And that's uh, an issue for the jury. Well, I, I don't know if it gets to the jury. I mean, I have to know what the factual scenario is and know if there's gonna be some point of, of, of challenge to it. But if we're talking about something that happened, if you look at the Zamora case, that's e easily distinguished. I take you to the TR case in this particular case in TR, which is a third DCA case from 2002. And in that particular case, that's where you had two young ladies who had been in uh, uh, HRS services at that point in time, and it went for over a 13-year period uh, in that particular case. However, the court found, the third DCA found, that it all came down to claims of individual negligence against the state. And they said, despite the fact that it had been many years, many actions, many I can't imagine a hypothetical. We've not talked about one that goes on for 13 years.
But when it came down to the claim against the state, it was an act of negligence. And the court cited in that particular case uh, that there was one occurrence, one incident in that particular case of 13 year separation. And they said something that I think is, 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 is notable in this particular context. They gave us the hypothetical that if you interpret the statute as the plaintiff was trying to do in that particular case by saying each of those were just individual trying to stack the various uh, 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 caps, if you will, the court talked about the analogy and they stated that would lead to the absurd result of making the statutory cap uh, meaningless in this particular case. And they gave the example of a surgeon operating. And they talked about if you, if, if you go down that path, when he opened up the patient, that's a cap. If you then look at the fact that he didn't suture correctly, he didn't do X, Y, or Z, you could stack cap on top of cap, and you make the statute meaningless, which clearly says maximum of 300 unless you go to the legislature. Mr. Mr. Pettis, may I also ask you a question? What, what is your reasoning, what is your interpretation of what this means? Uh, when totaled with all other claims or judgments paid by the state or its agencies or subdivisions arising out of the same incident or occurrence exceeds the sum of $300,000. Is it your position then that that cap applies to all, any agency or subdivision of the state? As I read that, and I think it has been found by uh, all of the courts, maybe with one exception, that's everybody inclusive. Uh, now, we're in a unique situation. If someone wants to say, well, agency X did something a year ago, I would have to know what that is because it's probably not related to February 14th in in, in Well, it would have to be out of arising out of the same incident occurrence. Correct. And if you're arising out of the same incident occurrence, it's a hard cap of $300,000. Why? Because it all started off this you, whole sovereign when you, immunity. When you talk about, your theory is that when you talk about incident or occurrence, you're talking about the underlying breach of duty, right? I'm talking about the act of the state actor. The, the, right, the, school the act of the state uh, actor, which constituted a breach of duty. Yes, sir. So I think the point that's been raised here is that, that could be a, there could be different duties um, that were breached in different contexts um, that all c converged on the, these, these horrible uh, crimes that, to, as the backdrop and cause of these horrible crimes. And so that, I, that's the kind of attention here um, in, in trying to, uh, to aggregate the way you want to aggregate, but describing it the way you describe it. Certainly, and, and if I understand what you're saying, Chief Justice, is that when you're dealing with multiple different agencies and the hypotheticals that we could come up with, um, uh, there may be a point in which you all look at whether there is one cap that encompasses and envelopes all of the agencies that are involved in this particular uh, occurrence, or are there separate caps per agency? That's an issue that as of today uh, is heavily weighted on one cap per all, for all. Uh, however, when you look at, uh, Justice we go to your particular question, uh, we don't stop at $200,000 in this text, period. It says R, and it goes on to the other language. If the collection of all of these actions reached the level of $300,000, it's, it's a hard aggregate. But they don't stop there. They then make provision. Uh, uh, the appellant uh, states that, you know, with the language they, they, they've cited in their, their papers uh, with regard to treating the state as individuals, a private citizen, what that is is to allow uh, the private citizens to challenge the state in court. It was a time they couldn't do that. The first statute we had, they had to go straight to the legislature. So when they're treating them as a private citizen, they still have, they still have limitations, which are the 200, 300, and the legislature's made provision for them to come to us so that we could be the gatekeeper and we can look at, and this is really important in this context because in a tragedy such as Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, our legislature in its wisdom has placed a lot of financial burdens on uh, responsibilities, I should say, on municipalities. And we have put, we have amicus briefs in this case that come from 
uh, between the two cases come from the League of Cities, Florida League of Cities, from uh, County Attorneys Association, as well as the Panhandle area's school districts, which are smaller school districts. And what the legislature has done is to put a lot of responsibility of security, millions of dollars worth of security responsibilities, hopefully to make this never to occur in our schools again. With that responsibility, we're now being asked to open up the sovereign immunity to allow multiple claims on what is clearly the most catastrophic case you can think of. When you have mass shootings, you have the most catastrophic cases we can have. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you, sir. sir. So, so you're saying that the cap applies across all of the government defendants? The case a law? Any, any government defendant. If it's arising. So, so D, in this case, DCF, Broward Sheriff, um, the school board, they all, they all count toward the $300,000 cap? As the as okay. law stand now, yes. So doesn't that even more push you toward just being reasonable about in the, the, giving the statute kind of a reasonable meaning that you would focus on the tortious conduct that actually caused the injury rather than looking at the claims? I mean, because the claims are never going to be, you know, the, the negligence that's asserted against each government entity, is never, it, there's always going to be differences there. Factual differences, but does it all sound in negligence and arising out of the same incident? If the answer is yes to that, then I think the cases have indicated it's all it's all the same cap. If we're talking about a scenario as, well, as what, what is the incident? incident occur what, what did you mean? Yeah, what's the incident occurrence yeah, well, here? You said same incident right then. Same incident in the context of, of just uh, the justice I'm speaking of. Things that occur on February 14th. Well, but that's the, again that's a little different than the theory underlying the rationale of the, of the district court, and I understand your primary theory here about how we, uh, um, what constitutes the occurrence or incident, because you want to focus on the breach of duty, except when there may be multiple breaches of duty by different people, and then it shifts to the... But in that, case, in, in, in that context, if there's multiple breaches of duties from different time periods, then in the context of that case, there may be for those other agencies, a different cap. If we're looking at the, no. if we're looking at the events of that day, yes, sir. For determining on a, a basis of whether there are one or more incidents or occurrences, and we're looking to the actual harm that was inflicted, it seems like to me we should be doing every single student. But if we're looking at the tort of the governmental entities, I think you have to treat those separate. So you can't have it both ways, it seems to me. It's one or the other. And, and, and I've stated, I think it's, if, 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 if there is no case that meets the factual scenario of what we're dealing with uh, as far as the, the combination of occurrences. And we're now in a time where you have mass shootings and all of those things. It's, you know, we, we, we're dealing with something different. However, in this particular case, when you have the agencies that, if they're all in negligence, and they're claimed to be negligence. A question that you all can address is, do those agencies have to stand on their uh, own cap separately? And that's a different question that I think is being asked here. I think the question is being asked here, what they're trying to do is to state that the $200,000 <laughs> is a level that each and every person that was injured can make a claim of, totally disregarding the aggregate. How do you read the statute and, and, and skip over the $300,000? And to say that we're not trying to impact the cap, that's exactly what we're here talking about. They're trying to multiply the $200,000 for every individual, the 17 that unfortunately were killed, the 17 that were injured, and the endless numbers, literally 60 or 70 people that have put the school board on notice for psychological claims. Every one of those individuals would have $200,000 cap. There's nothing in any of our case law and no reasonable reading or interpretation of 768 uh, uh, sub 5 that would suggest that. What it would suggest is that if you want to make those claims, every one of those individuals have a right to come into court and to recognize that liberty that our, 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 our statutes have given them and the legislature have given them. They can bring their claims and they can get a judgment. But in order to recover on those judgments, once you go past that threshold against the school board of Broward County, that goes to the legislature and it goes through the claims bill process. And you all are well aware that that claims bill process then looks at what are, what's the impact? 
What is the injury? What's the loss? What's the ability of the, uh, the public agency? Because they don't want to have a financial impact that we pay one individual for money that will never recover and make them whole for their loss. But at the same time, close the schools and, 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 and shuts down and have a financial impact on Mr. the agencies. Mr. Pettis, your agencies. time's up. If you could wrap it up briefly. Certainly. So I, I, I encourage uh, the court to, to, to the, the statute is, 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 is clear. The statute is, this is one occurrence. <laughs> Uh, one incident, it was the un uh, uh, unfortunate event of February 14. That goes to the maximum cap of $300,000, and anything beyond that goes to our legislature so that they can do their due diligence. Thank you very much. The statute talks about tort claims, as was begun at one of the arguments just now, I believe the one prior. In order to determine what is a tort claim and whether the, it arises from a different incident or occurrence, you have to look at the nature of the tort. To look at the nature of the tort, you have to look at the complete tort. You have to look at not just the act of negligence that may be at issue at a very high level of abstraction. You have to look at how that tort became reality. But when how a did, bullet but, impacted a human but being. But how do you, Mr. Rosenthal, how do you address the fact that it says when totaled with all other claims or judgments? So it, it, it the language, the language implies that it's irrelevant. You're looking at the whole picture of all the claims and or judgments. Well, here's where I disagree, okay. Justice Lagoa. It doesn't just say all claims and judgments. It says all claims and judgments arising out of the same incident or occurrence. No, oh, I understand and that. That's, of course, but that's, you can't, I would submit, look at claims alone without looking at where the roots of the tree come but, from. But then, then this goes back to the procedural, the first question that Justice Luck asked, which is, we don't really know what the procedural posture is right now of this case. Well, that's correct, and, and why, frankly, I feel like it puts us in an un, un, unreasonable position to be talking about claims and complaints that are not part of this record at all. Um, there will be, and you know, since the preview has been made, different allegations of negligence by different government entities at different times affecting different kids differently. Those who are on the third floor, those who are on the first floor, there was a time interval. But you agree that the Barnett case is procedurally prepared for uh, an opinion? Oh, I do, yes. And the third DCA in that TR case, we submit, got off the tracks because it looked only at claims. It, the hypothetical that Mr. Pettis repeated from that decision says, what if it, at Jackson Memorial Hospital, for example, in Miami, uh, the surgeon does a bunch of things wrong during the course of one operation? And then somebody can make a claim they did that wrong, they did that wrong, they did that wrong. Each one of those is a separate cap. And I say that's, that's wrong too. And it's in our brief as well. The reason it's wrong is it's not looking at the complete tort. The complete tort says you have to have a proximate cause of a separately identifiable injury. Otherwise, that's all one medical malpractice case. Okay? There are ways in the common law to segregate and separate different torts. And that, we submit, is the proper focus based upon the language of the statute. It's interesting, because I know you there's some... So your, what was you, the, can I just ask one quick question? What was the summary judgment here? That, did the court say that the school board's cap was 300,000? Correct. Well, it wasn't summary judgment. It was just it a was declaratory, just a declaratory judgment, saying, judgment. Even in the absence of facts or a complaint pled, pleading any uh, operative fact other than the deck claim, uh, the aggregate limit is following Barnett. Aggregate as to the school board, or well, I mean, did it, did it, was it assuming there's no other agency, or was it? It, it didn't say. It didn't say, and so we're we're in a, a fog on that. Uh, we would just submit that the language, and I apologize for going over it. Yeah, just wrap it up. Okay. The, the language uh, that the court that the statute uses about individual caps and aggregate caps, the only analog I have been able to find searching the common law that does something like that is insurance law. So that is an appropriate place for the court to look for the appropriate rule of decision. Thank you for your time. All right. We thank you both for your arguments. The court will now stand in recess. All rise.